Hello and welcome back to Food Center Entertainment. This time for my uh, final review out of the Wishmaster collection, which would be Wishmaster the Prophecy Fulfilled. Now, what's funny is um, it says 2002 on the back of this case, and this is commercially considered a 2002 movie, but according to the end credits copyright, at the very end credits of the film, this movie was actually made in 2001, so it was actually filmed back to back with the third film. People often don't really know that, but that's kind of what happened a little bit with these movies. The same thing kind of happened with, uh, with the Canadian releases of the um, Hellraiser films. To be more um, precise, um, Deader and Hellworld were filmed pretty much back to back, possibly even at the same time, and that's kind of the case with. Uh, Wishmaster 3, Beyond the Gates of Hell, and Wishmaster 4, The Prophecy Fulfilled, is they were actually filmed at the same time somewhat in back-to-back -back as well. Although it was released on DVD and VHS in 2002, it was actually made in 2001. And officially is actually counted as a 2001 movie, despite what, what commercial people have to say. That's actually what it is. We got, that, we got that out of the way. Um, this one has, of course, um, John Novak back as the Jin. Again, doing a very crappy job. Now, what's, what's interesting is the choice they had to play the human version of the Jin in the movie. Let's see if I can find his name here. Um... Michael um, Trusco, yeah, Michael Trusco, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Um, <clears throat> you might recognize him from Walker, Texas Ranger. He plays, I believe, uh, Walker's son. Grown up is, or is it the grown up version, of course, who follows in his dad's footsteps as a ranger himself. Um, that's how I really remember him from. But yeah, um, he did a much better job than I expected him to do. Again, I am definitely reminded about how <clears throat> John Novak, who plays Jen in his monster creature form, is a crappy actor, is a Jen, like he, much like it was in the third film. I'll be honest with you, I think that um, Wishmaster the Rossi Fulfilled would have actually been a better movie, as well as Wishmaster 3, Beyond the Gates of Hell, would have stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the first film 100% and not have any controversial, oh, it's not as good as the first two films talk at all, if Jason Connery had played the creature version of the Jinn in Part 3 and 4, as well as the human form of the Jinn in Part 3 and 4. I think it would have been better that way, but... They didn't do that. And that's really due to Chris Angel, the director of Wishmaster 3 and 4. The guy's a twit. Literally a really big twit. Just a big idiot. Didn't know what he was doing. He did stuff so much on budget that what's funny is... Um, you can see that you can see that the grade and and budget from three to four. Believe it or not, the stupid Halloween looking gin costume when it was kind of introduced in the second film, throughout the three sequels gets cheaper looking. Now I don't know how the hell they could do that, due to the fact that uh, three and four were kind of filmed back to back. I don't know, maybe somebody in the makeup department was tired or something, but it just Appears to me kind of like that. But, uh, what's very interesting about this movie is um, the editor supporting cast. I mean, you actually have Jason, Jason Thompson. Jason Thompson, of course, is from the very popular family TV show, um, Seventh Heaven. He plays the older um, son. 
I'm not a fan of that show all that much, but I do remember him. Um, this is probably, I think, his only movie that he have actually did. I don't, I don't ever think I've seen him in anything else other than this movie. He did a good job in the movie. He's about, about the only thing that really saves the movie is really him. Um, although I would have to say, um, the, the guy that does play um, the gin in his, his human form, I was surprised about how well he did um, in the role. But he's not um, Andrew Dikoff. Sorry, um, Andrew Dedoff, uh, as well as um, Jason Connery. Those guys nailed it far better than he did. But for what they gave him, I think he did a pretty good job. Um, the plot of the movie is very, very generic and very mundane compared to the third and first films. <clears throat> Basically... Our uh, main two characters are a, uh, a boyfriend and a girlfriend. It's never really been the clothes that they were actually married or not. <clears throat> but um, one can assume, I guess. Well, um, a defect in the motorcycle left the um, boyfriend, husband, whatever. Let's call him boyfriend, girlfriend because we never got that confirmation. Um, the boyfriend's legs and spine got screwed up to where he's unable to walk. And I guess um, the, most of the film takes place, I say, about a year and a half after the uh, tragic events of the motorcycle wreck, which of course paralyzed the boyfriend and left the um, girlfriend to tend to the boyfriend's needs. Of course, they, they, they live in the same house that they I purchased at the beginning of the film in Basically, you had the lawyer, who's the um, guy um, who was, who um, obviously, Michael um, Tursko, whatever his name is, um, is the character he actually plays. And um, he's trying to fight for their, for their case and trying to get them, you know, their money so that they can go ahead and pay the medical bills and move on with their lives. Well, he got this um, relic off of the uh, off of some website on the internet and was given as a token of appreciation and respect to his clients. Of course, it's the same artifact we saw in the third film. Or another one. It's kind of sketchy on that one if it's the same one or another one. Probably another one which means I don't understand why is the same exact gin from the third film in this one. It makes no sense. Like I said, a lot of things don't make any sense in this movie. I think that every single stone you come across that has a gin in it has a different gin in every one of them. But apparently Chris Angel didn't know that when he made this movie. <clears throat> and of course, obviously, you find the stone inside. He wants to get it appraised, puts it into his safe, the stone melts for the safe, the djinn shows up, and obviously kills the lawyer and takes his identity. And then what's interesting about this movie that's very different from the previous three films is that literally all three wishes are granted in a lot of ways. Well, all but the last one. The last one's kind of hard to grant because the last one was very interesting. Throughout the movie, because of seduction or in... Um, Manipulation. Our um, human version of the Jin actually seduces our main character, and she kind of falls in love with him. And her final wish is, "I wish I could love you for who you really are." And that's not really a wish that the Jin can actually grant all that much, because how could a mortal woman be in love with a hideous creature? And of course, by the end of the movie, the boyfriend obviously. Um, has his one wish, and he wishes for a way to kill the djinn. And of course the djinn takes away his ability to walk by reversing his wish of having, you know, that, that she, the wish that she made to have him um, be able to walk again. And um, he stabs the boyfriend with the, um, of course, archangel sword. And uh, the boyfriend sacrifices his life by finding a means to uh, have the girlfriend throw the gin onto the sharp edge of the knife.
And then, of course, the Wolf perish and the house gets destroyed and, the, and gets obliterated at the end of the film. She's left alone. And that's pretty much the plot of the movie. It's, like I said, kind of generic, kind of mundane, but interesting, yes, but not nearly as interesting as the third or the first films. Um, quality wines. This is where it gets really, really hilarious when it comes to this box set. Wishmaster is a brilliant movie. <clears throat> Wishmaster 2 is a decent movie. Wishmaster 2 is a, com is a comical, laughable horror movie. And Wishmaster 4 is just plain nonsense and forgettable. But they put all of their effort all of their quality and all of their effort into the worthless movie, which is Wishmaster 4, The Prophecy Fulfilled. Video, the best quality of all the movies in the set. Rather than being more warm and reddish toned for most part with just a hint of neutrality like the first movie, Although in a very good way, because I still think the first movie is brilliant looking as well. But, there's not enough coolness in that movie. And of course the second one, just generic looking. The third one, very digital, kind of more of the times of when it was made type of look of a movie. And the thing about three is like, and, um, two and three look more televised. Um... Four still looks like a TV movie to me. It still looks very much like a TV film to me. But the, um, the cutter temperatures of the movie and the um, overall um, how clean the, the um, Blu-ray version of the film is, is just the best looking one of them. In the audio, they, it makes not just good use of all five speakers in the sub in the room, it makes extremely good use of all five speakers in a subwoofer in the room. So I find it so weird that the one movie that the entire fucking world of Holder and all the fans in it can agree is the worst Wishmaster movie out of all four films gets all the quality in this box set. Maybe you should have rethought this Lionsgate. But with all that said, I will say that I really enjoyed this box set. Um, it was a very unique ex experience watching these movies theatrically instead of watching them regularly on just my 51-inch plasma screen. But watching this actually on a projection screen and actually having the feeling of going to a real actual movie theater to watch all four of these films was actually a very, very fun experience indeed. I would say that the only one out of all four of these movies that actually feels like a theatrical film and worthy of being shown on a 100-inch or bigger projection screen off of a projector is the first movie on the first movie only. The other films do not feel anything like a theatrical film. You can definitely tell the cheapness of it, that these films were never met for the big screen, except for the first movie. The first movie you performed um, very brilliantly is a, big screen, is a big screen experience. I definitely enjoyed it. Um, but that's pretty much that. Um, I am not taking the projector screen down yet. Not, not quite yet. The uh, film series I've always actually wanted to watch theatrically. And I said series, not trilogy. So for uh, the fans of the third film, I'm sorry, I will not be watching that movie. I do have it in DVD, but I will never watch that movie again. It is bad. It is really bad. And of course, um, I'm talking about Candyman in Candyman Farewell to the Flesh. I've always wanted to watch the Candyman movies as if I'm going to movie theaters. So I will be having two more nostalgic movies for you that are theatrical. 
and probably, a bit, probably more after that, but the films I really feel are not that great theatrical, I will not watch on the big screen. But that's it for this episode. I will see you guys next time for my review of Candyman. It will actually be Candyman Unrated. Until then.